God's word. I want to honor the Lord by standing and maybe more importantly by our attention and the focus of our hearts this morning. This is what 2 Peter chapter 3 says. It says, Dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I wanted I want to develop a gender, I want to develop a genuine understanding with a reminder so that you can remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. First, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, living according to their own desire, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They willfully ignored this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth were brought about from water and through water by the word of God. Through these waters, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Ask that you would agree with me in your hearts. So, Father, we approach you this morning. We approach your word this morning, knowing that by your spirit, through your word, we come to understand who you are. We come to understand who we are. We come to understand, most importantly, who Christ is. Come to understand eternal things, things that we wouldn't come to find out in our own knowledge, in our own world, but through divine revelation. And so, Father, we just ask that by divine revelation that we would experience you this morning and we would apply these words to our life. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good to be back. Last week, uh, we were um, on vacation as a family, uh, and it's good to get away. It's good to get away like that. But I will, I will just confess something actually here, having been gone uh, last week, and it's a good confession. Actually, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm upset about, but I'm kind of glad I'm upset about it, if I could put it that way, it, which is that. Um, I was excited when we, when we kind of mapped out this sermon series, I was excited to study the scripture from last week and to teach from it because it has one of like probably my second favorite verse out of second Peter was in the scripture for last week. It's second Peter two twenty two. Well, that's my second favorite passage in second Peter. And then next week, again, kind of bittersweet, Martha is going to be preaching from Probably my favorite passage in Second Peter. <laughs> so I'm left here with this one in between, which actually I've grown to love as well. But, so it's a little bit of a bittersweet thing for me to, to be away, to miss that out. And it's, it's good. I bring it up, actually, not just because of like, my own personal regret of missing having a chance to, to teach out of Second Peter 2.22, but I brought it up because it's a good introduction into our passage today. And we didn't hear it this morning, but I'll read it to you. It's a verse right before what Brent just read, and he says here, the proverb is fulfilled, as a dog returns to its vomit, and as a sow wallows in its mud. (laughs) And if you've ever owned a dog, you know what's being referenced here. We don't have to fill in the blanks for you. If you haven't owned a dog, you can come ask me later, and I'll tell you what he's talking about. But it's not pretty. (laughs) Now, I, I bring that up because it's just one of my favorite verses to, to quote. You know, people say, what's one of your favorite verses? And I'll point them at this and then they'll wonder what I'm thinking about. But I, lo- I love that. I love the image it creates. I love it. But, but, but I bring it up here because I want to contrast it with the way what Brent just read, the way our passage for today begins. 
And the contrast there is important for us to notice because he says this. He says, as a, as a dog returns to its vomit, as a sow wallows in its mud, and that's the picture here on one side. And then he says, but you, my dear friends. This word, it's a one word in my Bible. It has it as dear friends. The root is a familiar word to, to many of us. If you've been in church for any amount of time, the root is this word agape, which means Beloved. But you, agape toss, he says, my, my beloved friends. They're loved. And Peter leans into this. This is the first time he says it in Second Peter, but, but it kind of opens the floodgates. He says it, I think, four more times uh, over the rest of the letter, which there's not much more text left, and he just repeats it over and over again, that he really has, uh, uh, feel, like, he considers these people uh, precious to him. They're, they're his dear friends. I've already written you once, my dear friends, and I'm writing you again. And in both letters, he says, I'm trying to do a similar thing. I'm trying to develop a reminder for you, a reminder of, of the truth that you've heard. There's something special going on when he does this. And I want to draw it out right at the beginning of our passage when he says, but you, my, my dear friends, I'm writing you again to remind you of this. And I think what's going on here, I have an example of what's going on here. It's from my own life. And I want to share. It's a little bit bizarre, but stick with it. Um, when I was in high school, I had this job making donuts. And, okay. Uh, I had this job making donuts, and I loved it. In high school, I loved it, but I had to show up. I had to get to work at midnight so that they would be ready for people, like, first thing in the morning, right? And, and it was great. You show up, and no one else is there. It's the middle of the night. The, the place is dead, and you're just making these donuts and stuff. Um, and, and a bunch of my friends worked at the same place. And so we all kind of knew each other. And, and for the most part, I loved it. You know, it was hard after a while of waking up at that time and, and going into work. And so occasionally on days that I had off, I really looked forward to those times because I could sleep in and it'd feel great. And there was this issue this one time with my schedule where I thought, oh, I have this next day off. But the people I was working for did not think I had the next day off. And so they were counting on me to show up. And, and I was not going to be there. Went to bed thinking I get to sleep. In this disaster of the morning commuters not getting their donuts in the morning was averted because one of my friends actually knew what was going on. I don't know how this happened, but they knew that I wasn't coming to work the next day as far as I knew, and they knew I was scheduled to come in, and they knew there was this conflict, and they actually came to my house at midnight, my parents' house, at midnight, and knocked on my window. And like, you got to wake up. you got to go make the donuts. It's a goofy story, but like that's stuck in my memory because how amazing is it that this friend of mine knew me so well that they knew this problem was going to happen, right? They knew, my, they knew, oh man, he's not going to wake up for this. I've got to go help him out. And so they did. And I look at Peter here and I realize this is the people he's writing to. He knew them enough to love them into being better. He knew what they needed because they let him know them. It's really important we get this point. Just a few words into our text here in 2 Peter chapter 3. He's showing us something. As Christians, it is absolutely vital that you are known well enough to be loved well. Get this. It is vital that you allow yourself to be known well enough to be loved well. Because I can guarantee you, you are going through something. And it's uniquely yours. You are lonely. You are angry. <laughs> you are doubting in your faith. You're struggling. You're depressed. You have an addiction that you haven't told people about. You don't know what you're doing as a parent. You don't know what you're doing as a, as a, as a child. You don't know what you're doing as a worker or, or a boss. You need to be reminded in your situation, in a language that you speak, in the context of your life, that you are precious in God's sight and that he has plans and purpose and compassion for you. And the only way people can remind you of that in your language is if they know you. If they know you. Somebody needs to hear this, that if you only pretend to be known, then you can only pretend to be loved. You might not know this. 
I'm not sure I should share this, but you can listen to these sermons at any time. And you should. You should watch it many times. Go to YouTube and watch it as much and hit the like button or whatever they say. I look incredible on camera. Adds 20 pounds of muscle. <laughs> it's incredible. You, you can watch sermons anytime. You can listen to sermons anytime. But the opportunity to get to know people and to be known and to love and to be loved, that is here, that is right now. That is when we gather together. It's unique to this moment. It's one of the things we really emphasize here as a church, that, that verse, as iron sharpens iron, those two things have to come together for that to happen, right? So one person sharpens another. So you come here to be known, to be sharpened, to be loved by the people of God so that they can carry you to Jesus when you need it. That's the point here. Be known well so that you can be loved well. Beloved, Peter writes. Okay, we move on. We find this great little phrase here, good vocabulary word that Peter uses. He says, scoffers will come in the last days to scoff. The phrase last days isn't entirely clear where he's going there. People debate whether or not that's the end of the world kind of thing, um, last days, or <clears throat> more like the age after Jesus, um, last age. It could be age or days. That part's not totally clear, but what is clear, what we're definitely meant to know here is that scoffers are going to scoff. It's the one thing you can count on a scoffer to do, They scoff. Or maybe your translation has it, mockers are going to come and mock. Or as Taylor Swift would say, haters are going to come and hate. Probably scoff isn't a word that appears a lot in your vocabulary, or you probably don't use it that much. Um, but Peter kind of colors in the lines here, and he fills it in. He tells us what he means by this, how they are going to scoff, what they're going to do. He shows us what it looks like. He says, they'll come and mock, living according to their own desires, right? Living according to their own desires, whatever pleases them, saying, where is the promise of Christ's coming? Where is the promise of Christ's coming? Let's start there. This is a promise we find given all over Scripture. In Matthew chapter 25, this is Jesus talking, and he says, The Son of Man comes in glory, and all the angels with him, and he will, be on, uh, he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him. Uh, a similar promise out of Acts chapter 11, as uh, Jesus, you might remember, ascends up to heaven. The angels come and tell the disciples who are watching, and say, Don't, why are you looking like this? Don't you know that the Son of Man will return in the same way that he left? Paul devotes a lot of his time writing about this too. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. He talks about the, the return of Christ in Revelation. Uh, John talks about the return of Christ in uh, chapter 19, verses 11 through 14. Well, all, all over Revelation, but specifically 11 through 14 of chapter 19. Basically, as you go through the, the New Testament in this subject, in this, in this category... The Christian worldview is that we're moving uh, towards this event. Moving towards this point in creation where, where time and existence will end as, as, we, as we understand it. Uh, that, that time is kind of marked by the return of Jesus. Isaiah kind of puts it poetically like this in Isaiah 34. All the heavenly bodies will dissolve. The skies will roll up like a scroll and their stars will all wither as leaves wither on the vine and foliage on the, fig, uh, on the fig tree. There's a whole study of Scripture devoted to this idea of, of the end times, of Jesus coming back. A whole, a whole study of, of, of Scripture devoted to this. Um, actually, kind of interesting. You know, you've heard of biology, yeah? Anybody? Oh, we might need to start more rudimentary. Yeah, Dan, thank you. All right, Dan, this is for you. Um, you've heard of biology, which is a combination of two words. Uh, bios, which is a Greek for life. And, uh, and logos, which is Greek for word. So it's like life words, biology. I got more of these. I hope you like them. <laughs> Psychology actually is the same thing. Uh, the Greek word psyche, which, which means like uh, uh, soul or life. And logos, which is words. Theology, great word. Theos, uh, Greek for God. And our friend logos, words, God words. 
uh, theology is the study of God. And the study of the end times, the return of Jesus, that's such a big uh, concept in Scripture that it has its own name, too, in the study of the Bible, which is eschatology, which is the combination, as you're kind of picking up now, of these two words in Greek. Eschatos, which, as you see here, uh, end times. And once again, our friend Lagos, which is words, final words. Eschatology, in other words, this is a big concept and so big that there's a whole, uh, a whole uh, section of, of doctrine devoted to it, devoted to its study. Eschatology, the study of the end times, the return of Jesus. It's a big concept in Scripture. It's a big promise in Scripture. And when you think about it, when you think about how uh, Scripture presents this idea that there is an end time, that there's a final moment in time, it's a linear picture, right? We have a beginning in creation in, in the Bible, and then we have an end in these end times. It's like, so, so I, I thought about this, like we could put it like this, like this cable stretched out here. So we have, as you do in a cable, you have like a beginning point, Right? And you can think of this like creation, like, like this is when, when God spoke, and here's creation. And then you look on down the line, and it's kind of this linear picture where you're moving down this line, but it does eventually stop. It does eventually come to an end. Creation is, is moving towards a point, always moving forward in one direction. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul, as we heard earlier, uses an analogy of a Christian race being like running a race. And despite how it feels when you're doing it, races do eventually end, right? It has a start, it has a finish. And this is, the, this is, this is essentially the, the Christian worldview of, of time, that it starts and it has this linear progression and then it eventually uh, comes to an end. And you and I, at some point along this line, occupy this, this, this tiny space that serves to move the timeline forward and towards the eventual end and toward the eventual eternity, Right? Peter, when he presents scoffers, he presents a different picture. A presentation of a different image. I'm trying to think about the mindset that they're, that they're presented as having here. Instead of running a race, it's like a picture of a mouse on a wheel. Like, like, like time is just doing this, and there's no, there's no sense in moving forward. There's no sense in, in like a linear progression. There's no idea of a destination or an end, but it just, it just keeps going. It just keeps going. There's no idea that there's, there's a point at which things will stop where there will be judgment final moments. It just keeps going. So why do we even worry about it? The scoffers say, where is the coming of Jesus? He hasn't come yet. He must not be coming at all. So there is no end point. There's, there's only our life right now. The only thing that matters, according to this worldview here, is that the 80 or so years that each of us has, because if Jesus isn't coming back, there's no end to, to creation. We're not actually going anywhere. There's no concept of judgment, right? Each of us is just kind of spinning in circles, and life isn't going. We might as well enjoy what you have today. You might as well live, as Peter writes, according to your own desires. For a while, there was a saying and I think it was popular like 15 years ago. Um, it was really big. Maybe you remember it. The, the four letters, Y-O-L-O, YOLO. Um, interestingly enough, I won't tell you where, but Brent has this tattooed on his body somewhere. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was really popular for a while. You only live once was the idea, Y-O-L, you only live once, right? The idea that you only get one life, you only get the, these couple of years you have on earth, so you might as well do whatever you want with it, right? Do what feels good, because what you feel is all you've got. I can think of, I, I could, just to be fair, I can think of a lot of good motivation for like adventure and, and being courageous and stuff that can come from thinking like that. But Peter's saying, this kind of thinking actually ignores the truth, that as hard as you try to seize the day, it will always slip through your fingers. And as hard as you try to ignore the progression of time towards the end, it is still coming. This is where the scoffers are. They're saying Jesus is not coming back, which means we're not actually going anywhere. We might as well just live our lives for now. 
Now, you could kind of try to present the theological picture of, of, of why this is wrong and how this is unhealthy. But I'm actually going to say, I don't even think you need a theology. Do you remember that word now? Theos, logos? You don't need God words actually to argue about this. You don't need a Christian perspective to realize how broken this kind of thinking is. Because um, forget what you believe about the afterlife. We can't just live today. We can't just do this YOLO thing. Forget about the future. We're not even good at living in the moment. Even if, even if we only live for the moment, we're not even good at that. We can't be trusted with that. For your consideration, I give you the bowl haircut. Now, I'm going to tell you, I genuinely tried to find a picture of myself. Because when I was in high school, I thought this was the coolest thing ever. And I had one of these. And I'm, I'm not so proud that I wouldn't show you a picture. I just couldn't find one. I don't know who this poor guy is. Um, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. The greatest look since the rat tail. Anybody have a rat tail? I know Jason did. He's just not saying it. <laughs> but now, this is like the look of all the serial killers on TV, right? <laughs> We can't even be trusted with the moments, even if we're taking them and trying to take advantage of the moments. We can't even be trusted with that. That's not even a theological observation. That's just from my own lifetime I can see that. The things that I thought, oh, this is great. This is what I should live for. This is what I should do. Oh, my goodness. All kinds of fashion examples. We don't even need to get into fashion, though. I have a better example. I've been waiting for a long time to share this with you. Um, I think Peter would approve of it as being an example of how we can't live in the moment just because all of our wisdom and all of our best understanding reveal how we truly don't understand even the moments we're living in. So look at this picture. This is the, the Matterberg unicorn fossil. Um... This was uh, assembled in the 1600s when somebody dis uh, discovered some fossilized bones of a woolly uh, rhinoceros. But at the time, they didn't know what a woolly rhinoceros was, and this was all the bones they found. Uh, so this guy, Otto von Gericke, drew this logical conclusion based on the evidence he had in the moment and because the evidence he had in this day, and he had to make a conclusion, not saying, I'm not really sure what's coming in the future, but I know what I have right now. And what I have right now is a unicorn dinosaur. And so he built it. <laughs> on, it's on display right now in, in a, in a um, natural history museum. I mean, he's clearly wrong. This is not a real thing. But he had these things in the moment. He said, this is the best I can do with the moment I have right now. And since i got to take advantage of this moment, yeah, I'm going to build a unicorn dino. With, with the perspective of Jesus, we're able uh, to see so much further ahead. But when we don't have that perspective, we're just staring right down at our feet. And we think, I can see the whole world right here. <laughs> Even over the course of our lives, what we do with those moments is oftentimes shown to be foolish oftentimes show to be bowl haircuts or unicorn dinos. Embarrassing, to say the least. Dangerous, to tell the truth. The question is, my friends, as we're sitting here reading God's word, is why would we stay this way? Why would you keep looking at this moment of where you are and thinking this is all there is when we have been given such a greater perspective on the truth. Why not unloop this cord and realize we are on a journey towards something? Why not live knowing that your, your life, that, that everything is progressing toward uh, that time, that there is a journey, a direction, there is a hope for the future. Uh, Horatio Spafford famously writes in his hymn, right? Lord, haste the day where my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall descend. Even so it's well with my soul. Okay, 
So we don't want to be in the scoffers camp. We don't want to be scoffers. We don't want to spend our whole time looking down here and thinking this is all there is and not realizing that we are turning towards eternity. We don't want to prioritize our own desires of the moment because we understand not only how foolish we end up looking, but how dangerous it is for eternity. So according to Peter, you don't want to be a scoffer, but then he keeps going, and now we see what it is that scoffers do, right? They willfully, he says, scoffers live according to their own desires, and they willfully ignore this. Long ago, the heavens and the earth were brought about from water and through water by the word of God. Through these waters, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. It's a little bit of a mouthful. But when you dig into this argument, you can get to the point he's making, which is actually rather simple. When you, when you look through point by point at what he's saying here, you get simply this. The word of God started the movement of creation. And only the word of God can put an end to it. The word of God has the power of creation. The word gives the power of life and death to water. <laughs> the word of God is what stores up, with, withholds, as he writes, judgment. Said a different way, because of the word, creation exists, and because of the word, creation endures. By the power of God's word, life exists and endures. Scoffers willfully ignore the fact that each day is a gift and a miracle from God. The word of God created life. The heavens and earth were brought out of the water by the power of the word of God. But also the word of God maintains life. And the present heavens and earth are being kept until the day of destruction. How? By the word of God. Scoffers willfully ignore the fact that life exists and endures because of the power of God's word. So um, when my grandfather uh, died, he left me a pocket watch, which is pretty cool. I'm waiting until I'm mature enough, and I can grow a good enough beard to have a pocket watch. One day, you'll see it. But I was thinking about it this week, and I went out, and I dug it out. You know, it's kind of been buried since we moved. Um, and I went out and found it. And you, I'm not, you're not going to believe this when I tell you. It's kind of incredible. It's been years buried in a box somewhere. And when I looked at it, I mean, guess how close it was to the right time? Nowhere near. It was completely wrong. <laughs> Didn't you have the right date? I mean, it had been dead for years. <laughs> for, for, I mean, it was so far off. Be why? I mean, obvious, because nobody had been winding it, right? Those things, you have to wind them. You have to maintain them. You have to keep them going or they die. It needed it need to be kept up, and there was nobody there to do it. Peter is saying, it is only the word of God itself that is keeping creation until the day of judgment. That's it. God's word brought time to life, and his word is if he is giving life more time. <laughs> now, Peter will continue with this argument next week, and we'll get into the motivation. We'll get a glimpse of, of the heart of God in this next week. But our text today simply comes with this revelation that just as God created life, so God maintains it. The same power that set the universe uh, in motion is holding it from destruction, keeping it for destruction. This is what Peter says the scoffers willfully ignore. Life doesn't continue because God has lost control. Life continues because he is in control. Now this is why it's so important uh, to check ourselves for scoffing. Uh, as, well, as well, by the way, as whatever teaching it is that you're listening to. It's so important to check our lives for scoffing. You know how... <laughs> Um, you know how in the spring and summer and fall in Vermont, you go walk anywhere outside? What do you have to do after you walk outside in New England? You've got to check for ticks. Remember those days when we could walk outside? <laughs> <laughs> when you walk outside, you're putting yourself at risk for ticks, right? 
and when you're at risk for something, then you have to check for it. So you know, I went outside, I better check for ticks, right? I understand then, this is a lesson for believers. For people who know about God, you are the ones, if you know about God, you are the ones walking in the woods. You are the ones at risk. We are the ones at risk. Because scoffers are not people who ignore God. Scoffers are people who have learned about God, but aren't satisfied with what they find. Now listen to this. Because we, we want to say, oh, those scoffers over there. Right? But listen. Scoffers are the people who have learned about God, but aren't satisfied with what they've learned. Scoffers are people who learn some of the truths of God, but then say, that's not good enough. It's not good enough for me. It doesn't work for me. God should do what I expect him to do. God should act in a way that seems logical to me. God should act in the way I want him to act. God should get back in control and put an end to these things in life because these things in life are so bad, as far as I can tell. Scoffers are the ones who say, why does God teach this? I would teach a different thing. Why does God offer mercy? I would offer judgment here. Why does God give second chances? I would cut people off. Why does God put an end, uh, delay in putting an end to this life? If it was me, I would stop it right now. Scoffers are not ignoring God. They are recreating God in their own image. I got to say, we can't be surprised if we're dissatisfied with God after we've made him so small. After you've made him look like yourself. Church, check our lives for scoffers. <laughs> Let's expel those voices from our hearts right now. Consider the words of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. The Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Why would we expect them to be? And your ways, he says, are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Yes, God does not think like us, and that is something we can be truly grateful for. Let's treat every day for what it is. the gift of a generous, benevolent, patient creator who hasn't abandoned his children to despair. Lovingly maintains life for an oftentimes thankless creation. Each day, each day that creation stretches along this line is a breathtaking opportunity to love our neighbors. Each day along this line is an opportunity to store up treasures in heaven, to breathe in this life that God has given us. And above all, as Paul tells us, each day is an opportunity to proclaim the Lord's death until he does come. God, as always, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the glimpse into who you are, even as we can't really understand it, even as we are in awe of your otherness, of your greatness, of your sovereignty. Lord, we thank you for your patience as we're muddling through, as we're staring at our own feet sometimes, God, and can't get out of our own way. I'm going to get the worship team up here, and, and while they're coming, 
let's continue in praying. And I just want to encourage you, maybe it's time to check your heart for the voice of scoffers in your life. Maybe somebody in your life who has been distracting you from the sovereignty of God, maybe it's your own voice that has been dismissing the sovereignty of God. But may we not hear a message like this and think, oh, I'd never be one of those people. I'd never be somebody who didn't submit to the authority of the Lord. Let's realize this is a time to check our own hearts, to submit to God's sovereignty and God's goodness and God's plan. I don't know how that I don't know how that hits you. I don't know if that's an encouragement or or maybe it cause for some frustration. But what I do know is that however it hits you, the Lord wants to hear from you about it. The psalmist says, "Why are you so downcast, O my soul?" But you know who he says it to? He says it to the Lord. He says, "Great are your mercies every morning." You know who he says that to? As we, as we confess the, the scoffing voices, either our own voice or the ones we listen to, we know that we confess it to a God who is above all things patient and loving with his children. So let's continue this time response. And in this confession, God, you are our king. You are sovereign. I am not.